Okay, so hello and welcome back to another Unity multiplayer tutorial. In today's video, we'll be having a look through the boss room sample project that has just been released. I'll be showing you how to get access to the project and set it up inside of Unity so that you can build and play the game for yourself. We'll then have a dive into the project itself to look at how they set things up and how some of the code works. And then of course, if there are any features, systems, mechanics that you see or come up with that you think would be a good topic for a tutorial, be sure to let me know down below and I'll see if I can get around to it. That's it for now, so let's get started. As always, the links to the pages that I'll be showing will be down in the description below. So here we are on the page about the boss room sample project, and we've actually been here before. In my first video about the new multiplayer solution, we visited this page, it told us what was coming, and it said here we could save the date, but now it's able to be downloaded. If you want to, you can have a read through this yourself, as I said, it'll be linked down below. And like it says down here at the bottom, it's an educational template, so you can go into the source code and have a look through and do whatever you want with it. And it also tells you here, it is early access, so this project itself will be evolved over time. Like it says here, it's going to continue to be developed and supported. Because as new versions of the multiplayer solution come out, they're going to update the game to match that so that the uh, educational aspect of this stays intact, it doesn't get outdated. Now if we scroll back up, we have this button over here to take us to the Getting Started Guide, which will take you to this page over here, which is on the documentation. So this page explains how to get started with the boss room sample. So if you prefer following text tutorials, then this is here for you. But if you want to follow along with me in this video, we can scroll down here and we can get the project files from GitHub. So let's hit Latest Releases and it will take you to this page over here. The latest version right now is 0.1.0. So to download it, we can scroll to the bottom and grab the zip, but before I do that, you'll see here there are some known issues. So if you do have a problem and it's on here, then no need to worry, they're already aware of it. But if you notice something else that isn't on here, I'm sure they'd like you to report it on GitHub or to mention it in their Discord server so that they can sort it out. So go ahead, download the zip here. Once it's downloaded, make sure to unzip it. So I'm going to extract all to this location. So once it's done, you can delete the zip file and you're left with the boss room project folder. Now I'd recommend moving this somewhere else out of your downloads, probably to where you keep all your Unity projects. So I'm going to delete mine here because I already have it in my Unity projects folder. If you then open up the Unity hub, hit add and navigate to where your Unity projects are, find the boss room project. And to add it, you need to go in one layer to here, com Unity multiplayer samples and hit select folder. Now in my case, I already have it here, so I can dismiss this warning. And this uses 2020.3, so Unity 2020.3, and I've got patch 1F1. It really doesn't matter about the patch, just make sure you're on 2020.3. Once that's done, you can click this to open up the project. Once Unity has opened, you may be just in an empty scene. So go to Boss Room, Scenes, and make sure you're in the Startup scene. Once you're there, you can go File, Build Settings, Build, and go make a builds folder. So I've already done this. I've made in the same layer as assets, documentation library, I've made a builds folder and one inside of there called test build. And this is where my build will happen. And once you've done that, you can then hit select folder and it will build it to there. So once it's built, you can run it as many times as you want. I think the game goes up to eight players, though it might go past that. But all I know is it definitely goes up to eight. Now I'm going to run with four players here. The top left is going to be the host. So I'll hit start confirm, allow access to the firewall, and then on all these others I'll hit join, join, and join. So now by clicking the different characters, we can actually go through who we want to play. So I am player one over here, and I can click whichever character I want to play. So we've got the kind of warrior, archer, mage, rogue, and then warrior, archer, mage, rogue again. And we can do on all the different players. So maybe over here I want to be a warrior, over here I'll be an archer, over here I'll be a mage, and over here I'll be a rogue, let's say. And then we can ready them up. So ready, ready, and you see all the feedback happening across the different players. So we'll ready up. And once everybody is ready, the game will start. So the controls is left click to move and target enemies, right click to do your attack, and then you've got different abilities down at the bottom right based on which class you're playing. So let's hit OK over here. So here we all are. Now at the top left, I'm the warrior guy, so I'm going to run around. And as you see here, it's got synced movement on all the different clients. We've got health bars, names, obviously our different abilities at the bottom right. And let's say I go over here, I've got the first enemy I've attacked. I can start clicking on him to attack him. 
We've got the synced animations from attacking and moving, and we've also got emotes over here so I can wave, and you'll see on all the different players, my character is waving. And I can move over here and start controlling the wizard mage, so I can go down here and try and find another enemy. I'll bring him up here, and I can now turn around and start attacking him with my ranged attack, like this. There's obviously plenty of other cool stuff here, like we've also got the heal spell, you saw I just healed myself. If I go on the rogue down here, you can see I can use my invisibility spell. Once it happens, I get this cloak of pink mist, and when I run past enemies, they actually don't attack me because they don't see me. So I could just keep going and playing the game to try and finish it, but I'm sure quite a lot of you probably want to play it for yourself, and it's also quite difficult to juggle four players just on my own. So I think I'll leave the rest for you guys, and we'll have a look into the project itself now. So I would recommend having a look through the project and the code for yourself. It might be quite daunting at first because you look into one script, and that ties to another script, you've got all these references, and you don't know what anything does at the start, so it might take you a while to familiarize yourself with the project, but over time it gets easier and easier and everything starts making sense. So here in the startup scene we have various game objects that will exist throughout the lifetime of the game, such as the settings panel where we can control the audio of the game. If I was to hit play, this will persist through from the startup to the main menu scene, I can control the volume from here. We also have the game data source which acts as a mini database as such for scriptable objects. And then we also have, let's say, the network manager with all the prefabs that will be instantiated over the network and the player prefab is marked here, as well as scenes that are uh, registered to be transferred to over the network. We scroll down a bit. I'm pretty sure most of these settings are default, apart from connection approval is enabled, just like in the previous tutorial I made on connection approval. We also have the game hub, and if we go into here, it has three scripts. One is a general net portal, and then a client version, a, ser a server version to separate out some of the logic. So inside of here, it will explain. It's a general purpose entry point for the game, and it also has network messages. So if we scroll down, there's quite a bit here to wrap your head around, but we basically have a way to start hosting. That's their logic for when you start hosting. And if we go down here, we have various messages. So we can send over the network our own messages like uh, connect result and scene changed and then we can receive them and if it's on the server or the client we can do whatever we want. They also use the naming convention here C2S for client to server and S to C for server to client. So as an example we have the connection approval on the server. So let's go over to the server net portal and if I scroll down somewhere in here we have the approval check just like in my previous tutorial. Here's the logic for the approval check and you'll see over here, for example, they say S2C connect result. It's the method we were just looking at. It's a message that is sent from the server to the client, sending them a connection result. And they have this enum here, so connect status.success. And that lets the client know that the connection was successful. Now in my tutorial, I just sent across as the connection data, just a password, and that was it. But in their case, they send across an object, which means you can actually fit in more data there. So, for example, they send across the player's name. That's a good use of it. We can actually tell the server whilst connecting what we want to be called, rather than waiting to connect and then saying what we want to be called. So you can do that all in one go. And as another example, if we go back into Unity and open up the client script where they have that logic, we can scroll down and find where they connect as a client. And uh, if we look down here, for example, connect client, we start filling in this connection payload here. So if I put it onto multiple lines to make this easier to read, we have the three separate things here that they send. So they send a client GUID, which is just a basically a random string. Um, then we have over here the client scene, which is which scene they are currently in. And then the player name is whatever name they have when they go into the game. They then convert this object into bytes. And then with the bytes, they set it as the connection data, just like I did in the previous tutorial. And then we start the client, which will send that to the server. So now let's have a look at the character selection. So there's obviously a lot of code here, and I'll just be giving a quick overview of how some of it works. So let's say I wanted to click on this player one. Let's see actually what happens. So if we open up the UI canvas, we've got these player seats, which are just the different characters. If you go in the scene, you can see that here. So player seat zero, we've got the script on it to uh, select the player seat. And if I scroll down in here, 
this is the event, sorry, the method that's called by the button. So we go back into Unity, open this up, open up a bit more. There is a button component here. And when we click this button, it calls on clicked, which is here. And this will then call with a seat index. Keep in mind the seat index is just which character it is. So this is player zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So this would say if I clicked on the first character, on player clicked seat zero. And inside of here, it actually then calls an RPC. Now I haven't covered RPCs yet, but what RPCs are, are methods that you can call either on the client to then run on the server, or the server can call one to run on clients. So in this case, it's a server RPC. What that means is a client is calling this method, but it will end up running on the server side. So this RPC, which will send a message to the server, will send through a ulong, which is the client ID. So this is who it is that's actually uh, trying to change character. And then over here, the seat index, which is which character they're changing to. And then bool locked in is, are they locked in yet? So are they just clicking a character to preview them or are they actually locking in their selection? Now, if I hit F12 and have a look into this method, you'll see over here when this happens, it will then on the server side, uh, invoke an event saying that the client has changed a seat. So with this, if we want, we can go deeper. We can right click on the on client change seat event and see where it's used. So over in the server side for this, we can see it's subscribed to here and it calls this method. So when a uh, client changes character, the server will run this code. It'll say, find this player and make sure they exist. If they don't, then throw an exception. And then make sure that uh, we're still locking in. We're still in the lobby. If the lobby is closed, it means we can't change characters anymore. That's already done. Uh, then we go and say, okay, go through all the players and see if anyone else has the same character or if they're locked in. Not or, sorry, it's and here. So it'll make sure that the character you're on uh, is not locked in. So you can look at character two while someone else is looking at character two, but if someone else locks in, you won't be able to lock in as that character. And then it will update the data here. And we'll have a look at this lobby players network list in a minute. So it'll set your ID, player name, number, and various other things here, whether you're locked in or not. And then once you lock in, it will go through and make sure that if someone else is also looking at the character you've just locked in, it will effectively kick them off it. Like it says here, it will help clients visually keep track of who's in what seat, will kick out any other players that were also in that seat. Um, now, if we have a look at this lobby players list over here, it is a networked list. And what that allows it to do is when it updates on the server side, all the other clients will then see that. And then what we can do here is right click on this, go to references, and on the client side, we see here they subscribe to the event for when this list updates on the list changed. We'll go there and we'll say, what happens when uh, the list is changed, which gets updated whenever any player select, uh, selects a different character. So we look over here and this is where it updates all of the user interface on the client side. And of course, you can have a look through here and see how it does all that. So for example, update character selection and it starts filling in uh, game objects, info boxes and various other things like that. So as you can see, there is a lot of code and I've barely scratched the surface. I didn't want this video to be over an hour long. So I tried to keep it simple and I hope the bits I did explain make sense to you and that you can go through the rest with the same kind of method and try and understand, understand how it all works. Like I said at the start, if there are any features, systems, mechanics that look interesting to you and that you want me to make my own individual tutorials on building from scratch, then just let me know down below and I'll try and get around to as many as I can. But yeah, that's it for this video. So if you enjoyed or found it useful, then be sure to leave a like and subscribe. That would help out a lot. Share it with anyone that you think would find it useful. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. But of course, before I go, I've got to thank my patrons. A special thanks to Francisco Lira, Liz Kimber, Bearded Eye, Kat from Garfield, David McDermott, Evan Maxi, Yoris Letter, Casey, Katinka Mom, Lauren Simpson, Malvin Hall, Mike Troop, Rack, Sam Marcus, Ulfgrim, Andrew Williams, Chris Diplock, Theory, and Dario. If anyone else is able to help support the channel monetarily, the link to my Patreon is down below. If not, there are also links down below to other social media, such as Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. If you could help us out by following on any of those or checking any others out, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.